my great uncle, Jim Savage. He was a doctor who lived in San Bernardino, where everyone knew him as Doc. Uncle Jim attended Stanford University in Northern California during the 1930s. While he was there, he met and married his wife, Barbara Steinbeck, my grandmother's sister. Doc graduated from Stanford Medical School in 1939 and had three children. In 1942, Jim joined the U.S. Army Air Corps as a doctor with a reconnaissance squadron that was shipping out to Europe. Doc would not see his family again until 1947. What's unusual about Doc's wartime experience was that he shot some 90 minutes of personal World War II footage with his own 16mm film camera. Mailing the movies home to his family, he wouldn't be able to see his own work until the war was over. Each exposed role was shipped to the United States where it was developed and checked by the censors. After the war, Doc would project his films for family and visitors to his San Bernardino home. But most of the time, the 100-foot loads were simply stored in a hall closet. In 2005, Jim died at the age of 91, and I transferred his footage to modern digital media. During this process, I couldn't help but wonder, if anyone in these films could be found and shown pictures of themselves from another era, what would their reaction be? How do you feel when your past sends you a message in a bottle, or a carrier pigeon arrives after a 63-year delay? I ran many searches on the internet for the 14th Photo Reconnaissance Squadron without success. Then one day, I happened on a site that listed serial numbers for everything used in World War II and it hit me. The answer had been in front of me all along, but I'd somehow missed it. This was an airbase. And there were numbers everywhere. Doc took a lot of footage, but the highlight of it all is one special moment. A fighter in trouble makes a crash landing on a grass field. My great uncle must have known ahead of time because he was in place with his camera to capture the action. The plane makes a risky wheels up landing. Immediately the camera cuts to a man who looks shaken, smoking a cigarette and smirking. Could this be the pilot? And the plane is a Spitfire, the most famous English plane of the war. Was the pilot American or British? The plane has US markings. Did Americans use British fighters in World War II? I froze the image and pulled the number off the tail. I entered it in Google. Instantly I was directed to a list of World War II flight accidents and there, in the middle of the page, was everything. The date of the crash, the name of the base, and most importantly, the pilot's name. I looked the man up and sent him a letter. I included two stills I pulled from the film and told him I was making a documentary. Two weeks later, I got a reply. Dear Mr. Lorton, the person in the photo with a cigarette is yours truly. Someone gave it to me and I didn't even smoke. I had just returned from a mission behind the Ruhr. Many people do not believe that Americans flew unarmed, long-range Spitfires. I flew 51 missions to Berlin, Munich, buzzed on sites, airfields, etc. I would be happy to work with you on your proposed documentary. I called my crew and 10 days later we converged on Seattle. Camera, sound, and our producer, who's Doc's grandson. We drove to John Blythe's home to shoot an interview, then surprise him with the footage. We hoped he had never seen it before. How are you? Nice to meet you. This is our producer, Jason. Jason, how are you? We set up and asked Mr. Blythe what he did in the war. The day I was going to Berlin, they woke me up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I took off about quarter to 6. It was a beautiful day in England. I flew to Bradwell Bay on the East Coast, and I landed, and these pilots came over, and they said, what are you? And I said, uh, I'm photo reconnaissance. And then this one said, where are your guns? And I said, I have no guns. And he, uh, another one said, well, where's your fighter escort? And I said, I don't have any fighter escort. And they said, well, where are you going? And I said, Germany. I heard someone mumble, I wouldn't even go over there with eight other people. I had signed up for a program called Flying Sergeant, where young men 18 years of age with just a high school education could get flight training. I graduated in July of 1942. They sent us to Colorado Springs. When I got there, they said we well, were going to get F-5s, which was P-38s converted for photo reconnaissance. Most people didn't even know what reconnaissance was. I'd never even heard of it. We headed out to Europe the end of May of 1943 to Mount Farm, which was eight miles outside of Oxford. I had uh, problems with the F-5. The 15 missions I flew in them, flying at altitude, the aircraft didn't handle as well as it should. We were having a lot of problems with them, with engine troubles. The turbo supercharger regulator in the cold of Europe, it would freeze, which could blow up your turbo supercharger. So twice I got down to one engine on two missions. The British weren't having as much trouble, and they were flying Spitfires and Mosquitoes from the next base. I'd really wanted to fly a Spitfire ever since I was in high school. 
When I was in high school, it was the Battle of Britain, and that's when the Spitfire was a rage. I'd read about them ever since it was first developed. General Eaker and Air Marshal Peck played bridge together, and they decided that we should get Spitfires. The range on the Spitfire was as good or better than the F-5. You had better roll rate, you had better rate of climb. We didn't need any special training. I just started flying it. The Mark 11 that we had was a conversion from the Mark 9. It was the main British fighter at the time. They took out the guns and put in leading edge gas tanks. And we had two 36 inch focal length cameras mounted in back of us. A Spitfire was painted blue. It was called uh, PRU Blue, which is Photo Reconnaissance Unit Blue. And that was supposed to blend in better with the sky. I always flew unarmed and alone. Photographing the target, I'd come to the right of it, pull the nose around until I'd level out, and then I'd turn on the cameras and make a run across the target. And I'd usually make three or four runs across one target. If I was going to a certain target, I'd play like I was going by it, and if you went by the target, came around in back of them, a lot of times they wouldn't even fire at you. But I went all the way down the Ruhr, and they fired at me all the way down. I had them popping off my wings and everything else. All you do is just keep flying, keep your heading, and uh, try to ignore it. When it bursts, it's just a dirty black ball going off. People say, well, I saw 16 rounds or something. I don't know how you can tell that you saw 16 rounds. In fact, you're paying attention to something that you should be thinking about something else instead of counting shells, because when you're making a mapping run, you just keep flying. We had a Williamson printer that would print thousands of them in no time at all, because we took five million pictures of just our outfit. I figured that my dance card wasn't filled until I went to Berlin. I took off and it was beautiful. Immediately I got over the North Sea and I started climbing about 30,000 feet. And I had eight targets in Berlin. And so I started taking pictures and I noticed that one camera, the light wasn't working on it. And I didn't know whether the camera was out or whether it was actually working. So I figured I had to make another run to make sure that I got the targets, so I made about three or four runs over each target, which took quite a while. I think I figured it was half an hour over Berlin. I could see fires burning everywhere because the B-17s had raided just before I got there. I flew back to the base and I really felt bad about it because I thought, here I went all that way, spent half an hour, and I might not have gotten a picture. And so I went up to the mess hall, and this captain came up about an hour later. He said, we got the film back. He said, you got everything on one camera, so you covered all the targets. Yeah, I've had even fighter pilots call me a liar that I couldn't go to Berlin in a Spitfire. In fact, I almost got a fight one night over Mosul Lake over that because they said Spitfires didn't go that far. But uh, I got the Distinguished Flying Cross. The two pictures I sent you, we have Spitfire PA-944 crashed, and then there was a picture of you, and I didn't know if it was you or not. It was just in the collection with that one. What happened that day? Well, I was during the highway behind the Ruhr, behind the Moner Nether Dams. My headset cord got caught, and on the side we had an emergency down system for the landing gear, and it was a CO2 bottle and all it had was an upright handle on it. What happened, my headset got caught in it, and when I tugged on my headset, set off the CO2 bottle, which locked the gear up. And so I flew around for about an hour. I'd fly upside down and everything and work trying to get it down. In fact, I even took the crowbar that's in the door and put it in the handle, and they figure I stretched the cable to the landing gear by about an inch from pulling on the bend. And finally, I was running so low on fuel, they told me where to land on the grass. I just was hoping I didn't cartwheel or anything. And our flight surgeon was taking a movie of it, and he thought I was just practicing, and I was going to come in and 
take another pass at it and land. And he, luckily, he had his camera on, and he got the whole thing on the. Do you have that? No, he he has it. Have you ever seen it? Well, he's no, and he's dead now probably because he's was older. Okay, well let's show you the slides that we have. Let me fire this up. Now what are these off? Okay, now we have about a minute of film we think is from your base. Yeah, there's a C-47. The first night landing I ever made, I landed at Le Bourget at night. What kind of plane's that? The C-47, the DC-3. What's that one? That's a Spitfire. Oh, that's me. Hell, that's a picture. That's what Savage took. There's Bliss, and the other one was Dixon. They ended up a four-star general. Hell, I've never seen that before. Where'd you get that? That's a wooden prop, you know. Wooden? Yep. See, there's no bulletproof glass on a, like a fighter. Why was that, weight? Well, they figured if you, you, they got that close, you're dead anyway. I'll be damned. That's motion. Savage lives in San Bernardino. He was a doctor there. You wanna see it again? <laughs> yeah. Is there any chance to get that? Because my oh, kids. Oh, yeah, are, uh, you can have it. My kids would love to see it. There it is. Poppy <laughs> Dean. Get that cigarette out of your mouth. Yeah, hell, it flew that thing as soon as they put a prop on it, the radiators. Did you say you have a piece of the prop of that? Yeah, I had it, where'd they? Oh, here it is. That's amazing that you have that. <laughs> and you just keep it, you just keep it in your, in your closet yeah. there? Um, okay, so you said you knew the doctor had been filming this. How did you know that? He told me. Uh, yeah, he was our flight surgeon, Jim, Jim Savage. Well, the reason we have these photos is we're related to Jim Savage. I'll be damned. Well, he was my great uncle, and actually, Jason, our producer, is his grandson. Oh. Over there in the corner. <laughs> Why? Well, I, I met your grandmother then. Oh, yeah? In Palo Alto. She was living in Palo Alto, and I stopped in to see her after I came back. Very nice. I liked it. He was a very nice man. Well, he had two suitcases full of this stuff. So we have a lot of footage for you to watch, and you can, of course, keep it as well. Okay. That was the sweetest airplane. Any pilot should fly a Spitfire at least once. All these years, I've been telling my kids about it and never had it. <laughs>